Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to address some questions related to our presentations and the discoveries about C++ we have made in the last year. C++ in review. Over the past year, we have covered a variety of different C++ topics. This talk will be focused on a few corrections, commentary about some of the emails and comments we have received, and a few new examples to help explain some of the ideas a bit better. There is also an example we received from someone on the Standards Committee that shows how complicated the standard can be. We would also like to share a bit about how our team is structured and what we have learned in the past year. In one of our early presentations on modern C++ data types and value categories, there were several questions about the distinction between some data types and why value categories matter. A few people thought this was an area that was made overly complicated in C++11 with too many definitions. Of course, data types like int or double are based in math and are common to many computer languages, so these are typically easy to understand. Care, string, and containers like hash also have a long history in programming and make sense. Pointers are a carryover from C, and this data type is not that surprising to most. The problem is when we start talking about the data types L-value reference, const reference, and R-value reference. If you have used C++ for many years, then an L-value reference is what we used to call a reference. With the release of C++11, it was important to not just call this a reference, but to actually use its full name which is L-value reference. The reason we need to be more precise is that starting with C++11, they added the R-value reference data type. So when talking about a reference data type, we must qualify our terminology so it is clear which kind of reference we mean. The other place which causes confusion and can be hard to say verbally is that a reference data type refers to another data type. It is worth reiterating that a reference data type refers to some other underlying data type which cannot be a reference. Before C++11, the L value and R value categories both existed, although few developers really thought about them. With C++11, they were redefined and several new value category definitions were added. There are relationships between the different value categories, but for the most part, knowing the distinction between L values and R values will take you a long way. Value categories are partly necessary because the standard defines them and refers to them everywhere. More importantly, as a C++ developer, you need to understand value categories because they are the foundation for understanding move semantics, which is an extremely powerful tool. A nice way to think about value categories is like learning how the different pieces in the game of chess can be moved around the board. Knowing this information does not make you an expert at chess or even define all the rules of the game. But this knowledge is absolutely required before you can study chess strategy or understand how to play well. So let's go over these basics for just a few moments. An L value is a value which has its own identity and usually has a name. Since it has an identity, you can take its address. An R value does not have a meaningful name or an identity, and it usually has a lifetime which ends at the next semicolon. In this example expression, the data type for the variable count is const reference to an int. The value category is L value, since count has a name. The value of 42 has a data type of int and a value category of R value. This expression will assign 42 to count, thereby extending the lifetime of the R value beyond the end of this expression. In our signals and slots presentation, a question came up about a compiler warning that a user received in the activate function. In an older version of GCC, the user saw a warning about a parameter being set, but not used. This is a false positive, since the parameter really is used in the function. 
In order to better understand the warning, he posted a question on Stack Overflow. As part of that discussion, another person stated our code had undefined behavior involving a reference to a destroyed object. Let's take a moment to examine the code in a bit more detail and figure out if this really is undefined behavior. One of the replies on Stack Overflow showed the code we have listed. The idea of the copy tuple function is to extract each element of the past tuple and then use an existing STD function to forward the result. The person who posted this code is correct. This does actually result in undefined behavior. As an example, assume that we have a tuple containing only values like an int and a double. The forward as tuple function will create a new tuple containing an L value reference to an int and an L value reference to a float. When the copy tuple function returns, the references in the return tuple will refer to objects which are now out of scope. Our library uses similar code as shown in the second example. Note the return data type here is not deduced. It is the same as the data type of the variable sum tuple. This means that if the past tuple contains an int and a float, the value of the return tuple will contain copies of the original int and float. The copy occurs because the return type of copy tuple in our code is explicit and not deduced. Any data in the original tuple, which is a value, will be forwarded as an L value reference and then copied into the return tuple. To be clear, the copy happens during the return. This code is a great example of how careful you need to be with data types in C++. It may look like a trivial difference, but this one change in return types turn out to have a huge effect. This code is comparing the addresses of two different objects. In our original presentation, we said the less than comparison operator was undefined behavior, although using the equals equals comparison operator would have been well defined. We based our statement on a paragraph in the standard which lists all of the defined comparisons involving pointers. Since this particular comparison was not explicitly listed, and most all of the other ones were listed as defined with specific behavior, it seemed the standard was implying this one had undefined behavior. Although we were incorrect, it is worth noting that when the standard does not indicate something is defined, it is by definition undefined behavior. What we missed was a related rule a few pages prior, which said all cases not explicitly handled in the following section are defined. Based on our confusion, and someone who left a comment, we contacted a prominent person on the Standards Committee. It was fascinating to email someone directly and ask for clarity about this comparison rule. After a bit of back and forth, it was revealed that the C++ standard was a bit vague in this area. The intent was that this comparison is not undefined behavior, and it was decided by the person we contacted that this language should be cleaned up. So based on our presentation, a defect report was generated, allowing the committee to enhance the standard and make it less prone to misunderstanding. We are not advocating that every time there is a confusion, it should be assumed to be a problem in the standard. However, if you do find something which is unclear, there are good channels of communication for a C++ developer to use and find clarification. One of the most common questions we encountered regarding undefined behavior is about how to detect or trap undefined behavior in your program. This is simply not possible. Once undefined behavior is encountered, your entire program is considered to be in an invalid state. The only solution to handle undefined behavior is to not have it. This is why it is so complicated to deal with. Someone emailed us to say that undefined behavior is not a big deal to them. He made the point that once you have seen a few different types of undefined behavior, you just learn to simply avoid all these pesky things. 
Sadly, this is a common myth, and it leads to the idea that undefined behavior is just an error you made in your program or your logic. It is only an error in the sense that you have undefined behavior and your program does not work. Undefined behavior itself is not really considered a true error, since errors are actually well-defined. Finding undefined behavior can be tricky, since it can appear as if your code is working, and yet you may have a path which is seldom taken and can produce wild results. We also received some questions on mutable lambdas, so here is an example showing the basic principle. In this lambda, we are capturing x by value. Normally, when you capture a variable by value, the captured variable becomes const within the body of the lambda. By adding the mutable keyword, the captured values can be modified. Since the value of x is 42 when it is captured, x still contains 42 the first time my lamb is run. As we had discussed in our lambda presentation, assigning 7 to x in the main function has no effect on the value of x that was captured. The first time we call my lamb, the value is increased, so the message will display a value of 45. This new value is saved inside the lambda, so the second time we call it, the value would be incremented to 48. It's worth noting that if x had been captured by reference, the printed value for x would be 10 the first time and 13 the second time. As a follow-up on the subject of overload resolution, we would like to present an interesting example. In the main function, we have a call to do thing and two potential overloads to choose from. The first overload takes an L value reference to an int. The second overload uses a C style var args parameter list, which can receive nearly any data type. Take a moment to see if you can tell which overload is a better match. Since the data being passed in main has a data type of int, the first overload is a viable candidate. Int is also a valid argument for a C style var args function, so the second overload is also viable. Based on the rules of overload resolution, the second overload is not considered as good as the first candidate. So we have our answer. The first overload is chosen. However, there is another consideration and a slight problem. When the compiler actually calls the first overload, an error is generated. The data type of object.m underscore data is an int, even though it is part of a bit field. The standard says you cannot bind a non cons reference to a bit field. The rules of overload resolution only take data types into account. And in this example, the selected candidate produces a compiler error. Even if another overload were added, which does take a const reference to an int, it would be callable, but it would still not be a better match than the L value reference in the first candidate, and the compiler error will still occur. Since the overload resolution process does not follow the same rules as the function call process, there are a few cases where overload resolution selects a candidate that does not work over one which would. In our presentation on futures and promises, we talked about how exceptions should be handled in a thread. Our terminology was a bit confusing, so let's revisit this topic. If a thread encounters an exception, Instead of throwing, it should place the exception object in a promise if one exists. This allows the exception to be thrown later in the thread which needs the result. If there is no promise object involved, you must design some other scheme for the thread to report a failure. It is deemed a bad practice to throw an exception from a thread, since it is unclear who would catch it. According to the C++ standard, throwing an exception from a thread calls std terminate. Another way of looking at this is to say exceptions cannot cross from one thread to another. Exceptions may be used within any one thread in exactly the same way they are used in a single-threaded program. 
One of the most valuable ways to learn C++ is to attend meetings, conferences, or participate in an active open source project. If you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, please consider joining the SF Bay Area ACCU group on Meetup. There are no fees involved. ACCU stands for the Association of C and C++ Users and is an international organization based in London. Those of us in the Bay Area are very fortunate to have one of the most active C++ user groups in the world, with a presentation nearly every week from a variety of incredible speakers. There are also groups in many other cities in the U.S. and Europe. Even if you do not live in this area, the slides for most of the presentations are available on GitHub for you to view. There is a wealth of information available from current and past lectures in this repository. The main conference for the C++ community in the United States is CPPCon, which is in Bellevue, Washington. The conference has a large number of sessions covering many different levels of programming expertise, so anyone with an interest in C++ can learn a great deal from the experience. It's also a fantastic venue to meet and network with other developers from all over the country and across the world. If you're interested in collaboration, brainstorming with like-minded programmers, or possibly searching for a new employer, you should definitely plan to come to CPPCon. One of the major things we have learned over the past year has been the value of collaboration. The core Copper Spice team works primarily in a pair programming environment, which provides an amazing opportunity for instant code review. In order to work this closely with other programmers, you need to master communication skills. Having the ability to communicate clearly about code is not something everyone can initially do. One of the best ways to enhance your skills is to discuss abstractions and ideas in the early stages of development of a project. Listening to the silly or outrageous ideas from others is crucial for a project to evolve. Several of our libraries were started for this exact reason. LibGuarded was inspired by the difficulty we had communicating about locking in a multi-threaded program. This was based on a fundamental problem in the level of abstraction in our existing code. This library was designed to encapsulate access to shared data at a higher level of abstraction. The CS String Library was based on an active banter at a C++ conference with a number of other developers. All of us wanted a better string class that could handle different encodings. Working on a problem using pair programming and brainstorming out-of-the-box solutions is very different from the idea of a typical team meeting. Incorporating new resources is a good way to improve productivity. The service provided on godbolt.org has become something we use frequently. This is a great tool for understanding how various compilers will interpret and optimize your code. The site is set up so you can paste in a short sample of code and see how it would behave. The output is the compiled object file. If you are unfamiliar with reading compiler output, take the time to watch his video recorded at the closing keynote for CPPCon 2017. Matt Godbolt gave a wonderful talk called What Has My Compiler Done For Me Lately? Working on our open source projects, we have found the challenge of supporting multiple platforms is very time consuming. It takes a while to understand how build systems work to set up something like Jenkins or Travis and to test on different platforms. It is also very helpful to have people on your team who know the various platforms because very few people are experts on the intricacies of every single environment. The documentation we have developed is absolutely invaluable. Docs need to be more than how the API works. There needs to be sections on how to build your projects, what are the supported platforms, and how to migrate to new versions. We refer to our own documentation constantly to ensure it is usable. It is a well-known secret that the best way to learn C++ 
is to teach what you know to somebody else. Inevitably, they will ask questions or see angles which you simply did not expect and never even considered. Teaching is an incredible tool for learning. One of the ways you can take advantage of this is by speaking at one of your local C++ meetings. Another idea which works well is to set up a semi-regular training session at your company. You can take turns with other developers to practice your teaching skills and trade ideas. These presentations have taught us to pay more attention to the requirements and boundaries set by the C++ standard. When we debug code, we routinely ask the question, can this be considered undefined behavior? When writing classes, we now discuss, can this be movable or copy constructible? And what can be defaulted? We have been amazed by how much compilers have improved in the last few years, how the sanitizer programs help with optimization, and all of the great ideas we are hearing for future versions of the C++ language. I came to C++ with a background in a now obsolete object-oriented programming language, which was weakly typed, had no pointers, but it did have garbage collection. I had to unlearn references, which was a huge challenge. Working in a language with garbage collection, you never even think about memory lakes. C++11 really threw me for a loop. I had been using the language since the first standard came out in 1998. When Barbara hurt her back in early 2011 and was resting for a few days, she was bored. Poking around the internet, she found some videos from a recent Boost conference. I joined her and promptly tangled myself up in confusion. I could not comprehend why an R value reference is usually an L value. The new rules in C++11 changed the language so drastically that my intuitive understanding of the language no longer worked. I chose to start over and learn C++ properly from first principles and based on the written standard. I wanted to ensure the side effects of my code did not result in undefined behavior. It may sound silly, but the last year has taught us more about C++ than we ever anticipated. Every time we picked a topic, it turned out that information was exactly what we needed to fix something in one of our projects. We are grateful that others have found this information of value as well. We have a lot more to say about C++, especially since the Copper Spice project is migrating from C++14 to 17 by the end of the year. There are going to be things we discover and want to share. If there are topics you would like to see discussed, please let us know. As we move forward, it is our desire to continue doing these presentations for the community. The only part we are adjusting is the frequency, which is going to change to once a month. Our deepest thanks to everyone who has watched our videos, made comments, and subscribed. We would like to ask that you tell colleagues and other C++ enthusiasts about this channel, so more developers can view our presentations and banter about C++. For more information about the Copper Spice project, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in a few weeks for our next video.